Major funding for NJTV News is provided in part by RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of New Jersey residents and businesses for more than 100 years. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Tonight on NJTV News, attacking the tax plan. Senators Menendez and Booker come to a middle-class neighborhood in Bloomfield to rail against the Republican tax reform plan. NJTV in your neighborhood to focus on escaping modern-day poverty. Come Tuesday, the seats here in the 11th District will be some of the most competitive to watch. Plus, money matters in the governor's race. We get a peek at Democrat Murphy's tax return. Spoiler alert, he's rich. And Atlantic City's mayor charging voter fraud in the upcoming election, claiming someone's casting dead folks' votes. Those stories and more next on NJTV News. Live from the Agnes Barris NJTV studio at 2 Gateway Center in Newark, this is NJTV News with Mary Alice Williams. Hello, thank you for joining us. Nothing gets voters' attention quite like taxes, but it's tax reform that gets U.S. Senators riled up. Senators Cory Booker and Bob Menendez are presenting a united front in the fight over rewriting the tax code. Chief political correspondent Michael Aaron reports. If Republicans in Congress thought repealing Obamacare was difficult, passing tax reform could be just as hard. The bill unveiled yesterday is not sitting well with representatives of high-tax states. If you have Jersey pride, you should be ticked off right now. You should be angry because Donald Trump is coming after Jersey. The top concern of New Jersey's two U.S. senators is that the bill caps the deduction for local property taxes at $10,000. Many New Jersey homeowners pay more than that and would lose the deductibility of anything over 10000 If you think your property taxes are already too high, just wait until you're taxed twice on the same money. Menendez said you can't get more middle class than Bloomfield, which is where the senators were today. Their host, homeowner Peter Tom, said the average property tax bill on his block is $13,000. It's very likely that almost everyone on the street is going to be paying more because of this legislation. The tax reform bill has many other noteworthy changes. It eliminates the deduction for medical expenses, for student loan interest, and caps the mortgage deduction at $500,000 on new purchases. But it's the state and local tax deduction that's drawing the most objection. The bill eliminates the deductibility of state income and sales taxes, even as it caps the property tax deduction. If you pay taxes in this state, you are about to get screwed if this passes. House Speaker Paul Ryan said the bill helps the middle class. With this plan, the typical family of four will save $1,182 a year on their taxes. Democrats see it through a different looking glass. It's a plan that adds 1.5 trillion, 1.5 trillion to our national debt to pay for massive giveaways to giant corporations and the heirs of billionaire fortunes. Supporters of the bill point to the cut in the corporate tax rate from 35 percent to 20. President Trump is calling that jet fuel for the economy. But four out of five New Jersey Republican congressmen say they can't support the bill as is. The fifth, Rodney Freelingheisen, is noncommittal. The Democratic senators say they're open to negotiation on a tax reform bill, but that so far no Republican leader has invited them to the table. In Bloomfield, I'm Michael Aaron, NJTV News. The property tax portion of tax reform tops today's business news. Here's Rhonda Schaffler. Rhonda? Mary Alice, it's not just residents of Bloomfield that pay more than $10,000 in property taxes each year. 
We've pulled data on 2016 New Jersey property tax bills from the State Division on Taxation, and we found there are at least 145 towns across the state where the average property tax bill is above that $10,000 mark. The counties where residents pay the most in property taxes, Essex and Bergen, where the average residential bill is over $11,000, and Union and Morris, where the average bill tops 10000 The money is adding up in the final days of campaigning ahead of the general election next week. The latest report from the State Election Law Enforcement Commission says spending by independent special interest committees on the legislative races has now surpassed previous records at $21.5 million. That's up 33 percent from the 2013 election. The heaviest spending has been in the third legislative district. The union that represents New Jersey Transit says the rail line failed to collect $2.4 million in revenue over nine months because of short staffing and crowded trains. That's according to a report in Bloomberg. The United Transportation Union Local 60 based that calculation on forms submitted by its employees. The union says the missed revenue could be even higher by year end because there was a shortage of forms this year. NJ Transit says the union's analysis was flawed. The union says it expects missed revenue to surpass $3.2 million. Job growth bounced back across the country in October as 261,000 new jobs were added. That was around in line with expectations, a little bit below. But the jobs picture is very muddy these past two months because of all the disruptions from Hurricanes Harvey and Irma. The unemployment rate fell to 4.1 percent, a 17-year low. There was a disappointment. The latest numbers also showed wage growth fell last month. But an economist at PNC says the bottom line is the U.S. job market is in good shape. On Wall Street, all three of the major indexes ended the week at new record highs. And those are our top business stories. Next Tuesday's election day, New Jersey voters are set to elect a new governor <clears throat> and fill all 120 state assembly and senate seats along with some mayor's offices. At the top of the ticket, the candidates for governor, Republican contender Kim Guadano has been demanding her opponent's tax returns, while today, Democrat Phil Murphy opened them to journalists, including senior correspondent David Cruz. To be clear, neither the Guadanos nor the Murphys are hurting for cash. In a state where the median family income is over $87,000, both candidates for governor far exceed that. Kim Guadano's family income for 2016 was over $306,000. Not bad by most standards, but Phil Murphy, his income of $4.6 million is well above the state's median. And every chance she gets, Kim Guadano reminds us of this. Goldman Sachs millionaire. The Goldman Sachs millionaire. Phil Murphy spent $20 million to buy the Democrat nomination. This week, the Democrats' campaign released a summary of the Murphys' joint income tax return. But for a deeper dig, the campaign only let reporters get a peek behind closed doors in a conference room at the Hilton in Newark. The campaign has only given us two hours to look through these documents. And since numbers is nowhere near being in my comfort zone, I brought along our business reporter, Rhonda Schaffler. No cameras allowed inside, but we were able to get a look at around 60 pages worth of return, which showed holdings in a wide variety of companies, mostly through investment funds. Companies like Merck, Cigna, CVS, Coca-Cola, Royal Caribbean Cruises, Simon Properties, News Corp, a.k.a. Fox, Gannett, Disney, and a bunch of other banks, energies, and retailers. They paid half a million in income tax and just over 200000 in real estate taxes. Their refund, if they didn't apply it to next year's taxes, would have been around $692,000 this year. The family lists 175000 in charitable contributions. He's clearly very well diversified. There were hundreds of companies that he's got funds invested in. So we don't see a concentration all in one particular group. Most of his income was from capital gains. So that's from his investments. In fact, zero salary. That's correct. Yeah. The, uh, the other thing was interest. Murphy says if he wins, his dough will go into a blind trust. Today, his opponent kept up the criticism of Murphy's wealth. One, he didn't work a day to earn that money. And two, we don't know how he earned that money. So we don't know whether or not he made his multi-millions of dollars by 
profiting off of gun manufacturers or fracking companies. That's a little bit about what we know. It's likely that with investments in so many companies, Murphy's wet his beak in fracking and other things that might raise a hackle from his opponent. But four days before Election Day, the biggest revelation gleaned from a two-hour perusal of his family's tax returns is that Phil Murphy is a very rich man, which won't come as a surprise to anyone. In Newark, I'm David Cruz, NJTV News. Meantime, Murphy's Republican opponent, Kim Guadano, was pushing her conservative agenda hard everywhere she went. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan was with her. Her Main Street, not Wall Street tour bus pulled into Hawthorne on time, but polls put Republican candidate for governor Kim Guadano 14 to 16 points behind. The lieutenant governor did not mince words with voters. Yeah, I need your help. I need to go with his good, but I need help, help, help. Guadano stayed on message, promising to lower property taxes and refusing to let New Jersey become a sanctuary state. That resonated with the mayor. And what about sanctuary state? I think that's probably one of the worst ideas I've ever heard. Uh, Hawthorne, and Hawthorne, we are very patriotic Americans. We stand for the national anthem. Uh, we respect the military, respect the flag. And anything that would be a danger to our safety as Americans, we're against here in Hawthorne. Good. That's great. Well, I think that's the number one thing a governor should be responsible for doing, and that is making sure people stay safe. It's kind of an obvious thing, you would think. That a slap at opponent Phil Murphy, he counterpunched, demanding that Guadano reveal the results of the New Jersey Attorney General's investigation into a controversial hire she made as Monmouth County Sheriff in 2008. Guadano brought retired County Investigator Michael Donovan on board as a chief. That should have suspended his pension payments. But Guadano listed him on payroll as an officer, according to WNYC. That let Donovan simultaneously collect both his $87,000 salary and $85,000 pension. Well, the pension board did actually call for the investigation. Well, I think the answer was quite clear. There was no, no investigation. You can go ask the question any way you want, but the answer was there was nothing to see. There was nothing to, to hear. It was silly season. The attorney general's office had no comment. Guadano continued her trip through suburban communities today, meeting with seniors, supporting local candidates, soliciting votes from a shrinking pool of undecided the most recent poll shows 7% of New Jersey voters have not picked a candidate for governor. After Guadano personally made her case to a couple small business owners, we asked... Have you made up your mind yet? No, I have not. Wow, it's late in the game. Yeah. I want to hear and see what everybody has to say. And you're still making up your mind? Yes, we are. But uh, I'm, I do like her a lot. Guadana will be on that bus and on the road for the next three and a half days trying to fire up the base and convince undecided voters like Frank and Nancy to vote Republican. In Hawthorne, I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJTV News. There are some hotly contested mayor's races, too, and it doesn't get much hotter than in Atlantic City, where Republican Mayor Don Guardian says he's the target of a widespread voting fraud scheme involving votes cast on behalf of people who've moved out of town or are already dead. His campaign has alleged people were offered payments to vote for Democrats, including Guardian's challenger, City Councilman Frank Gilliam. Guardian's calling for an official investigation into the way mail-in and messenger ballots are being handled, saying, and this is a quote, stop the dead people from voting in Atlantic City. There are down-ballot races to fill legislative seats, and if you're looking for a race to watch this election day, the 16th legislative district in central Jersey is it. Brianna Vernozzi reports. Is this mission critical right now in this district? Absolutely. And uh, as you know, we actually have now 11,000 more Democrats in our district than Republicans. And this is one of the target districts. They're spending a great deal of money. They're going to outspend us three to one because they really think, because it's a split district, that they can win all three seats. Republican incumbent Senator Kip Bateman is talking about Democrats. A series of events over the last two years weaved an intricate web in this race. And Democrats are hopeful they can leverage the unpopularity of Governor Christie and 
President Trump to take full control of the district. Seats are currently held by Bateman with a split assembly ticket. Andrew Zwicker, a Democrat who narrowly ousted former Assemblywoman Donna Simon in 2015, and she's now looking to retake her spot. And Jack Cittarelli, a Republican. Cittarelli gave up his seat this year to run for governor, but came up short, leaving his spot up for grabs. It was the redistricting in 2010 that changed this from being a safe Republican area to more of a swing district, adding in towns like South Brunswick and Princeton. Well, uh, losing by 78 votes and a very low voter turnout um, is uh, something that uh, we learned our, our lesson on how to um, even work harder. Uh, voter turnout is critical. Which is why the GOP slate plans to hit 20,000 doors by Tuesday, hoping Somerset County freeholder Mark Caliguire will round out the ticket in the other assembly seat. We represent the district. You know, we represent the entire district, and we're with them on the issues that matter to them. With attorney Lori Poppy and former Prudential executive Roy Fryman on the Democratic side joining Zwicker. What are you doing differently this go around for this campaign? We're actually not doing anything differently. The campaign's based upon a real grassroots effort. We have volunteers coming from across the, not just the district, but across the state. We have a, a message that really resonates with people. And so it's doing the same thing that happened in 2015, but doing it even more this time. You have a formidable candidate in Kip Bateman, incumbent, well known in the area. I do, and I think the difference between Kip and I is I have a stronger background in mental health issues. I have a stronger background working with children with developmental disabilities, with addiction issues. I'm also an attorney. I was getting more and more frustrated with what I was watching in politics, and I was yelling at the television more and more, and I decided to do something about it. Democrats say they haven't felt a squeeze with extra resources going down to the 3rd District to help wage that Sweeney and JEA battle. but. Only Tuesday will tell. In Princeton, Brianna Venozzi, NJTV News. There are also two questions on the ballot that ask all New Jersey voters to decide where money for some specific project should come from or go to. Leah Mishkin reports. When you get to the polls next week, you'll be faced with two questions. The first will ask, do you approve the New Jersey Library Construction Bond Act? What it's essentially saying is the state would borrow $125 million. Then the state librarian in consultation with the president of Thomas Edison State University would hand the money out to different municipalities and counties. The money would be used for things like building improvements, increased capacity, and updates to technology. People in favor will argue libraries now help to bridge the digital divide, giving people without access to computers the ability to use the internet for things like college preparations and job searching. Plus, those in favor say libraries haven't received any additional funding for 15 years, and they are in desperate need. But people against this proposal say that $125 million is just a loan and will be added to New Jersey's debt, which the bill says was over $153 billion, $518,843,000 last year. Opponents also argue our libraries are among the few institutions that already receive funding under state law, with 33 cents out of every $1,000 in local taxes going to fund them. The second ballot question focuses on the environment. It reads, quote, do you approve amending the Constitution to dedicate all monies collected by the state relating to natural resource damages in cases of contamination of the environment? When there's an environmental lawsuit, money from settlement goes to the state. Take the recent Exxon case, which settled for $225 million for alleged contamination at its old industrial site. Language in the 2018 fiscal year budget allows the current administration to divert $175 million of that money to the general fund. To be used however they see fit, only $50 million has to be put towards environmental concerns. Environmentalists want the money from environmental settlements to be put in a lockbox, only to be used to repair, restore, replace, or preserve the state's natural resources. But then you have people against it. They also argue we should never 
tie ourselves down in terms of spending money. It's up to you to vote yes or no on these two statewide ballot questions. In the newsroom, Leah Mishkin, NJTV News. A huge academic honor that tops tonight's Garden State Express, our first stop, Brick Township, where Brick Township Memorial Chemistry teacher Maria De Bruin has received a National Milken Educator Award, considered the Oscars of teaching. They surprised her with the honor at an all-school assembly, but the recognition's not surprising. Mr. Bruin spent five years as a chemist at the pharmaceutical giant Merck, bringing real-world experience to her classroom. She convinced the school to acquire a spectrophotometer. She posts her classes online, presents scientific research at school-wide meetings, mentors teachers, advises the school science club, and created the Fit Club, where non-athlete students can exercise and learn about healthy living. Next to Ewing, where students will get their health clinic after all. When the College of New Jersey announced last April the clinic would close because it was too costly, students staged a sit-in in the president's office, demanding it stay open. And after careful review and restructuring, TCNJ's announced a new health and wellness center to continue the work of the closed clinic. It'll be a training center for students in health fields, as well as a resource for the whole community. Finally, North Cape May honoring vets on the day the nation pauses to honor them. In Cape May County, home to the United States Coast Guard Training Center, the Veterans Administration says veterans make up nearly 9% of the population. To thank them for their service, the Cape May Loose Ferry is offering vets with valid IDs, free round trip fares if they're on foot, and deep discounts if they're driving. They'll also get free coffee or soda on November 11th and an 11% discount on everything else. And that's the Garden State Express for Friday, November 3rd. Something up in your neighborhood? Tip us off. factors keep people in poverty? That very complex question was the subject of a special NJTV In Your Neighborhood forum in Trenton held to identify solutions for those still chasing the dream. The moderator was Michael Hill. At this NJTV In Your Neighborhood community forum, statistics paint the picture of modern-day poverty. Here in Trenton, the poverty rate is 28% under the federal poverty guidelines, which is about double the national average of 15%. 36.3% of the households in this city live 200% below poverty. We have 17.4% African Americans in poverty, 18.6% Latino, 19.1% Native Americans, and 8.5% whites in poverty in this state. Statistically, 62% of Americans will be poor at some point during their lifetime. The people who come through the door, most of them have a work history. That's number one. They didn't come uh, in choosing to be poor. In listing the causes of modern day poverty, you can hear what perpetuates it and what can be done to reverse it in a high income state where one in four New Jerseyans lives in poverty in a state that ranks seventh worst for income inequality. And we found that only 18% of the people who work in the city of Newark live in the city of Newark. And I, I'm going to tell you something shocking. The identical statistic applies to the city of Trenton. It is literally also 18%. And so when De Demelza talks about you know, the need to raise the minimum wage in New Jersey, if you're making minimum wage at $8.44 an hour right now, your annual income, if you're working full-time year-round, which is a big if, unfortunately, too, is less than the federal poverty level. It wasn't just the panelists offering solutions about escaping poverty. It was also folks in the audience. It's important that they get their children enrolled in early childhood education. It changes the game. And we talk about how education is the great equalizer, and we believe that it is. But when you look at New Jersey, New Jersey is the second most, the school district has the second most uh, segregated school districts in the country. The issue is that when you have such abject poverty, it impacts your businesses. We have two true supermarkets 
in the, city, in the city of Trenton, Trenton proper. 7.25 square miles, 84,000 people, and we only have two real supermarkets. A former inmate, now a gainfully employed husband and father, suggested advocates focus on the poor having an inner impoverishment. If we can incorporate that in our goal, I think that we will be very successful in what we are trying to do. It was an audience full of suggestions, urging more solution-oriented forms like this. In Trenton, Michael Hill, NJTV News. Now some noteworthy facts from tonight's program that help you know Jersey. Four of New Jersey's five Republican congressmen say they can't support the tax reform bill as is. The fifth, Rodney Frelinghuysen, is noncommittal. At least 145 New Jersey towns have an average property tax bill above $10,000. In Cape May County, the VA says veterans make up nearly 9% of the population. And the Election Law Enforcement Commission says independent special interest spending on legislative races hit $21.5 million, a record. If there's someone who you'd like to get to know Jersey, share. Use hashtag know Jersey. To share any story you've seen tonight, go to njtvnews.org. I'm Mary Alice Williams. For all the men and women of NJTV News, have a nice weekend. The members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. And PSE&G, we make things work for communities. Funding for Chasing the Dream is provided by the JPB Foundation and the Ford Foundation.